by professional development in the history in the U.S. history content area. Um, today we are fortunate enough to have uh, Dr. Bruce Lorry from UMass Amherst, and to properly introduce him, I'd like to invite Dr. Mark Santow from UMass Dartmouth. So, welcome and enjoy. Uh, hello, everybody. Great crowd here today uh, to hear a talk that I think in some ways is probably more relevant than it might have seemed before uh, 24 hours ago, perhaps. Um, my name is Mark Santam. I'm an American history professor at UMass Dartmouth and a former student of Dr. Lawrence, as a matter of fact. Um, he is probably more responsible than uh, any other professor I've met for uh, making me a historian. Whether either one of us will rue that fact or not, I don't think so. But um, in one of his classes my first year in graduate school at UMass Amherst, uh, he helped inspire me and lots of others uh, to be excited about history, about the research, and about the relevance uh, of, um, of studying ordinary folks and their uh, political actions. Um, Bruce is a professor at UMass Amherst, uh, easing his way into retirement. Um, he is the author of a number of seminal works in the so-called New Labor History, uh, essentially tries to look at the history of working people uh, from the bottom up. Uh, initially uh, wrote a book called Working People of Philadelphia that was published in 1980. Uh, another one, Artisans into Workers, which is a, a terrific kind of synthetic <coughs> overview of the history of work and labor in the 19th century, which I've used in classes before. It's being uh, reissued, I believe, by University of Illinois Press. Uh, and we're here to hear him talk uh, about the substance of his new book, which I think uh, most of you have, uh, Beyond Garrison, Anti-Slavery and, and Social Reform. <coughs> um, I'm not going to try and describe what the, the book says, because he can do it better than I can. But um, just a couple of things sort of leap to mind for me that the, the book does, some of which I think perhaps are relevant for events uh, that have taken place very, very recently. Um, he makes a couple of arguments in the book. One is that the anti-slavery movement in Massachusetts was much more of a working class grassroots affair than is often assumed in the historiography uh, and perhaps in the wider culture. And then I think more importantly for present day events, uh, he makes an argument for the relevance of the importance of politics, that politics matters, uh, that it is in the end politics uh, and the exercise of power in the traditional political realm uh, which brings about change and that uh, perhaps in some ways the way to bring about radical change, uh, if one seeks that uh, in America, is through uh, political means. Uh, there's been a great deal of writing in uh, American history over the last 20 years or so that has sought the sources, the reproduction, and the way to challenge power in other venues, in culture, and in identity. Um, and one of the most interesting things about this book, I think, uh, is that Bruce tries to bring it back towards uh, the sort of traditional notion of, of politics. Uh, and I think that's valuable, um, depending on whether you are a glass half full or a glass half empty person, or a person of the left, or not a person of the left. Uh, the person who was just elected president of the United States yesterday appears to be a uh, moderate child of Frederick Douglass, Saul Alinsky, and others who advocated uh, essentially bringing about radical change through pragmatic means. Um, so with that, uh, I will give over to Bruce Loring. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, is any, I, I have some tables for you, so whoever doesn't have uh, some facts and figures, raise your hand and please share them if you can, because I uh, will sort of short. It's always good to see my former students, especially when they're so successful as Mark Santow. Uh, Mark, uh, when he started working with me, he did this really wonderful um, research paper on the integration of uh, Massachusetts schools. It's a, it became a book. It became a book. Did? It? I wish. No. Yeah. Well, it should. It's the best treatment there is on why uh, Massachusetts was the first state um, in the union to integrate its schools, particularly in the city of Boston. So thank you. Uh, it's good to be here. How many of you are, are high school teachers? Middle school teachers? Good. Good. I feel at home already. I'm going to um, I'm going to talk to you about abolitionism, um, and I'm going to 
not really talk about my book, uh, or I'll talk about it only in, in a very specific way later on. What I want to do is, um, is a couple of things. I want to paint a very broad picture of slavery first, um, and then talk about its antithesis, anti-slavery, uh, to make a couple of points about, um, about slavery and how it worked. So um, these are my basic points today. These are the points I'm going to be emphasizing in the course of this talk. I'll go for about an hour. Um, interrupt me if I'm going too fast. Um, um, shake your fist at me if I'm being boring. Um, and I'll try, to, I'll try to do what I can. But I'm going to make uh, several points in the course of, of, of this afternoon. One is that uh, slavery was universal in the ancient world. Uh, slavery was not exceptional. It was the norm. Uh, it differed from society to society, but everyone from the ancient Hebrews um, to the Greeks, uh, <coughs> the Romans, the Muslims, the Ottomans, everybody, everybody had slavery. Everybody. Um, so that's the first point I want to keep in mind. Uh, the second is that beginning in the, around 1450, in the middle of the 15th century, slavery and its form uh, changed. It had been used, it had been marbled through most societies. Slaves could do anything in ancient Rome. They could be soldiers to, to some extent, teachers, house servants. Later on, they would become plantation workers. Um, the same was true in, in, among the Ottomans. You could find slaves everywhere. After 1450, slavery becomes associated with plantation labor. So it's form <coughs> change, and it becomes racialized becomes racialized. It had never really been racialized before. There's some dispute about that point, um, but generally speaking, slavery had never really been racialized. Um, the 18th century, 1700 to 1800, you can think of in a cruel sort of way as the golden age of slavery. I'll get back to this point in a minute from one of the charts I, 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 I passed out. But more slaves were exported from Africa uh, and imported into the new world from 1700 to 1800 and any other time, than any other time. The 19th century, the period I'm going to focus on once I get through with this introduction, was the age of emancipation. The age of emancipation. Really important point. If you think of the 20th century, what do you think of? Think of equality if you want in the 20th century. But what, what, are, the, what are the great events of the, 19th, 18th, of the 20th century? War. World War I, World War II, Vietnam, blah, blah, blah. A pretty bloody minded century, all things considered. Women voting. Women voting. It had some positive sides. But we know the 20th century largely through war, mayhem, famine, etc. Not a happy time to have lived. We're all glad to have survived it. The 19th century was an age of moral improvement. And the most important improvement that human beings made in the 19th century was ending slavery, largely for good. The, uh, <clears throat> there were two emancipation. It's the second that we'll be, we'll be concerned with here. The second emancipation uh, was largely, um, it, it moved from uh, a, an apolitical position, in other words, agitation, to uh, a movement toward political engagement. So anti-slavery to me by the middle of the 19th century is synonymous <coughs> with political activism. And as Mark pointed out, and I'll emphasize here, not political activism by really prominent people, by ordinary people. It was ordinary people who made change in the 19th century, just as they did in yesterday's voting. So we're on relevant turf here. And finally, and it's another relevant point, political activists. Um, who opposed slavery in the 19th century made citizenship a primary part of their project. Now, this is important because we'll see in a minute almost every nation in the, in the Western world liberated its slaves starting in, well, oddly enough, Vermont. Vermont is the first state in the Western world to liberate its slaves, 1777. On the chart I gave you, it's, it's, it lists another place that did it in 1793. Vermont, Vermont was the first. Vermont. The last was Brazil. The last was Brazil. Those, none of those nations, except this one, <coughs> none of those nations except this one, 
granted former slaves citizenship rights. And that's what we're going to wind up today. Okay, so those are my basic points, and now I'm going to move ahead. Um, um, first, if you look at the chart I passed out, fact, the facts and figures chart, <coughs> can, you, uh, can you follow me? Um, look very carefully, slaves um, who survived the, uh, the Middle Passage uh, are brought to the U.S. Black Africans from West, West Africa, Central and Central Africa, that's 11 million who made it. Some people think as many as 15 to 18 to 20 million were actually extracted from Africa. So there's a huge death rate in, in, in the trade. The other point that's not reflected in this chart is if you look at a map, look at a map of Africa, we're looking at the traffic from the west coast of Africa to the western hemisphere. There was another trade that went from uh, eastern Africa into the Middle East. Almost all women uh, for Muslim harems. At least, at least two million. At least two million women were shipped to the uh, Muslim world um, in this period as well. So, um, it's, um, we're talking about a huge traffic in human beings. The biggest trader is who? <coughs> Portugal. Portugal. Portugal was the first nation to engage in the slave trade. It's the last nation to abolish it. The Portuguese handled at least almost half, half the slaves who came across the ocean were in Portuguese ships, funded by Portuguese and Venetian and Italian merchants. If you look at the number of slaves delivered to each country, again, uh, Brazil uh, tops the list. If you go to the next, next page, um, first employment of slaves in the Americas, uh, you see where slave labor was used. All those endeavors, all those endeavors, apart from mining, had to do with plantation slavery. What's really interesting, I think, about um, the use of slaves is what are they producing? Offspring. More slaves. Sorry? Offspring, more slaves. Offspring, yeah. I mean, but what, what are they producing on plantations? Sugar? Sugar, cotton. Coffee? Coffee. What else? Tobacco? Cotton. How many people had sugar today? How many had coffee today? Yes. Uh, you, guess how many, uh, you don't have to put your hand up. Some have tobacco. It's okay. We don't have to fess up. What's the point? What's the point of all those products? They're a great demand because they're addictive. In some sense, they're addictive. The key to understanding slavery from the 15th century to the 19th century is that slave labor produced products that people really wanted or really needed especially sugar. The big money was in sugar. So um, think of what would happen today if we eliminated sugar. Or coffee. Or coffee. Um, if you look at um, the, 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 the next chart, which is um, a list of uh, slaves in the United States. I don't, want, I don't need to go into this in much detail. It, it states the obvious. Most slaves are in the South. But there are a good number of slaves um, in the North as well. We had slavery here in Massachusetts. Rhode Island was the largest slave state in the North. So just uh, keep that in mind. Finally, uh, take a look at the last, um, last page, please. Abolition dates in the New World, the, the last page of the, of, of the facts and figures. Um, here's the point. Slavery was five million old, five millennia old by the 19th century, right? Five millennia. <coughs> Think of this. 19th century people in the Western world and some in the, in the East and some, and, and some in Africa, um, it took them 100 years to abolish what had existed for five millennia. 100 years to abolish what had existed for five millennia. So don't tell me that change is impossible. They overthrew one of the most deeply rooted systems in human experience. Predates Christianity. In some cases, predates the family. It doesn't predate monarchy, but it's a deeply rooted system that lots of people benefited from, sometimes even ordinary people. So that's why the 19th century is special. Right? 19th century people undid 
what it took five millennia to create, and which, I would argue, uh, they ended an institution that was becoming stronger, not weaker. Slavery was becoming stronger. Slavery would not have died a natural death. It was abolished through political means um, in every nation and uh, empire. Only two nations went to war over slavery. Who? Haiti United and the United States. Only two of us uh, went to war over slavery. It's a, that's an important point uh, to keep in mind. So that's sort of the lay of the land here, and it is why I think the 19th century is so important and why the people I'm studying or have been studying is so important. Let's shift back to the U.S. Um, I want to talk about and get to the Constitutional Convention. 55 men gathered in Philadelphia in uh, 1788 to draft our Constitution. Many of them were slaveholders. All, almost all the Southerners were slaveholders or had an interest in slavery. So slavery was a point of hot debate at the Constitutional Convention. Southerners insisted uh, that slavery was above the law, that it was a natural institution, and that Southerners would not agree uh, to entering the Union, uh, ratifying the Constitution without some protection, some positive protections. There are some dissenters. This is one, this is Governor Morris uh, from the state of New York, colony of New York at the time. Well, state of New York. Uh, Morris um, argued uh, strenuously that um, there was something unfair about using slaves to reflect representation in Congress because slaves were property. And if slaves were property, then you couldn't use slaves to decide the population of a state, which in turn would decide how much representation the state got in Congress, right? I mean, his point was, if you're going to use property to determine um, representation in Congress, why not include this chair? Piece of property. So that was one critique of, um, of, of slavery, that it was politically unfair uh, to the North. Uh, George Mason was a Southerner, and Ma Mason had his own ambivalence about slavery. Um, Mason took the position that slavery was wrong for two reasons. First, it, it made people poor. It made people poor. It held down economic development in places like the South. And he's one of the first to point out that if you looked at the South, there's no such thing as a middling class in the South. There are rich planters, slaves, and who else? Poor whites. And he says this is an offshoot of slavery. Slavery will impoverish most people. The other point he made uh, was sort of ingenious in some ways. He said slavery distorts the human, the human being. Slavery makes it impossible for people to be sympathetic. In fact, it turns them into brutes because slave masters must use power and authority. They must use the whip. And his argument was it was making the South a very uncivilized place. So we have a couple of cogent critiques of slavery in the 18th century. But notice, no one really raised the question of its morality. No one really debated the point that slavery was somehow immoral, that it was a sin. That would come later. As a result, uh, the critique is, is there, but it's weak, and, Northern and Northerners and Southerners have to make a compromise in order to establish the, our Constitution, and so they do. If you look at um, the page on the Constitution I gave you, you will notice that slavery is discussed in uh, uh, four, uh, uh, really uh, three clauses in the, in the U.S. Constitution. But it is never mentioned by name. It is never mentioned by name. Some people hypothesize, some scholars hypothesize, that the founding fathers were sort of squeamish about saying the S word, so they never did. So what we, got, what we have here is, described uh, in the US Constitution are three protections of slavery. Uh, Article 1, Section 2 is the three-fifths clause. That for purposes of representation, bonded labor will be count three-fifths of a person. Three-fifths of a person. This would give the South a decided advantage in Congress over the next three generations. Three-fifths of a person. Second, um, 
The slave trade would not be closed, international slave trade, the transatlantic traffic would not be closed until 1808. Until 1808. The English would, 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 would end their, their, their uh, transatlantic trade just before. So it would be open for another uh, 20 years. Uh, that was a major concession. And finally, the Fugitive Slave Clause, uh, Article 4, Section 2. It, it required the federal government to track down fugitive slaves and return them to their owner. So there were three places in the Constitution. There's actually four. There's a, there's a tax clause that slaves couldn't be taxed more than $20 per capita. Really strange. We don't treat any other piece of property uh, that way. Nowhere does it say that they're supposed to be, that there can be a lid on taxes on imports. Um, it's really, really extraordinary. Nonetheless, they got away with it. And so the Constitution, in its own way, in its own peculiar way, uh, recognizes chattel slavery. Nonetheless, between 1777 and 1824, all northern states abolished slavery. Some do it immediately, as we did in Massachusetts in 1783, uh, due to a legal decision. Others, more typically, did it gradually. So the children of slaves would be liberated after a certain date. So the last slaves actually pass out of existence in the North in the 1820s. So we call that gradualism. Gradualism. The first emancipation has to do with gradualism, not immediate emancipation. Nonetheless, um, some, some critics of slavery, um, especially in Britain, first in Britain, begin talking about immediate liberation. Immediate liberation. What we would call immediatism. Now, some African Americans have spoken of this too in the 1790s and uh, turn of the century. But this woman, who we don't have, I mean, this is the best image we have, it's Elizabeth Herrick. Uh, she was an English abolitionist who, in the 18 teens and 20s, started churning out propaganda in the form of pamphlets in the form of pamphlets for people to read, much like Thomas Paine's Common Sense, so they can understand what her arguments were. Um, notice this, immediate, not gradual abolition, or an inquiry into the shortest, safest, and most effectual means of getting rid of West Indian slavery. Doesn't leave much to the imagination, does it? Uh, she's really one of the first important immediatists, uh, <coughs> writing um, for the internet, for an international transatlantic audience. That's Elizabeth Herrick. By the time this pamphlet uh, made it to press in the middle of the 1820s, African Americans in the United States were beginning to pick up uh, the, call, the call for immediate abolitionism. In New York, uh, a handful of black abolitionists founded a newspaper, Freedom's Journal, and they began arguing that immediatism is really um, no longer, excuse me, immediatism is the way to go. What really inspired this upsurge in immediate, immediatist uh, <coughs> politics was the second emancipation uh, by the 18 teens had developed a new tactic. A new tactic was called colonization. Anti-slavery activists, uh, elite anti-slavery activists in the, uh, in the 18 in the teens began talking about solving this problem of slavery and the problem of African Americans in one fell swoop. They, in the US, they bought a colony in Africa called Liberia, following the British uh, effort to do the same thing. The British bought Sierra Leone. These are two colonies on um, the west coast of Africa. And the idea was planters would free their slaves and then ship them to Africa. So the idea was that colonization would be an incentive for, man, for planters to free their slaves and that, in, in that way, we would be big not only of slaves, but of African Americans as well. African American leaders began reacting against this. Um, the, uh, the group in New York I just referred to, uh, around Freedom's Journal, began attacking colonization pretty viciously and arguing, um, that's no solution to the problem. We are Americans. Uh, we want to become not only liberated, but we want to become American citizens. No one put this argument more forcefully than David Walker who in 1829 in Boston published his appeal. This is probably the hardest hitting 
immediatist track we have to its top. Walker took the position that slavery had to be abolished by violence and force if necessary through <coughs> revolution on the part of slaves. So he's really the first American to talk about ending slavery through violence, through revolutionary struggle. He went on to argue that liberation wasn't enough, that if slaves were going to overthrow their masters, and if they were going to continue to live in the United States, slaves had ex-slaves had to be made citizens. So Walker pairs, pairs the, the strategy of mediatism and citizenship. Mediatism and citizenship. Mediatism and citizenship would go hand in hand um, for the next uh, of, uh, 40 years in the United States. Some whites would pick this up. Some whites would pick this up. Benjamin Lundy was a newspaper publisher in, um, in Baltimore who founded a newspaper called The Genius of Universal Emancipation. And he begins arguing, too, for immediatism and citizenship. And in 1828, he hires a young Bostonian named William Lloyd Garrison. How many of you have heard of Garrison? So you know. Uh, Garrison is the son of a Newburyport uh, nurse. Um, his father was a mariner and alcoholic, largely untrustworthy. He left the family, abandoned this, his, his, his wife with two children, and Garrison was raised by a single mom, a devout, method, a devout Baptist, who infused in him uh, a deep and burning sense of moral right and wrong. Uh, she was a, a teetotaler, a temperance advocate, and as far as we can see, something of an abolitionist herself. Garrison um, picks up the mantle of immediatism and anti-colonization. And in 1831, he will establish um, a newspaper called The Liberator. Here it is. Uh, this newspaper would run from 1831 to 1865. Um, this is on, available on film. It's the most important primary source we have for the study of abolitionism. Um, its, leadership was, its readership was largely black. It's widely read. You cannot determine how many people were actually influenced by it, because when somebody would read it, you would gather your friends around and read it to them. So it was, it was, it was written to be read, like most 19th century literature. Garrison's program consisted of several principles. Again, the most important was immediatism. Immediatism, the immediate abolition of slavery, slash anti-colonizationism. He's a vicious critic of colonization. In fact, if you read the first, the, the, uh, the first oh, five or six years of The Liberator, almost every edition has a searing, uh, a searing attack in the editorial section against colonizations because he was a colonizationist himself at one point. It was a sort of expiation for him. Immediatism. Second, moral suasion. Moral suasion. This was a tactic designed to convince people that slavery was wrong. Now, we use the, word moral, the term moral suasion to distinguish it from political activity. Garrison was political at first, but by the middle of the 1830s, he argues against getting involved in politics. He himself never voted, never voted. Then thought voting was a bad idea. Politics is a bad idea because all politicians are corrupt. And the minute you get something into, into the political arena, it becomes corrupt. So you can't count on politicians to do anything positive about slavery. So you've got to do it through moral suasion. Now he thought that if you could be persi uh, persistent enough, you could convince slave owners to liberate their slaves. They would do it out of the goodness of their heart. Non-resistance. He's a pacifist. He's a pacifist. He refused to engage in violence of any kind. So he establishes a kind of Quaker posture. So here's a man arguing to ab abolish slavery uh, and then not thinking that it's going to cause violence. There's a certain naivete uh, about him. But non-resistance was an important part of his program. It would become more important, important as time wore on Garrison would become an advocate of world peace by 1836 and 1837. Finally, civil equality. 
Civil equality. Uh, Garrison argued, as an African American activist did in the late 1820s, that if we're not going to colonize African Americans, here we have to make them into citizens. And so citizenship became an important part of the abolitionist agenda, and no one was a stronger advocate for it than Garrison. In um, 1832-1833, abolitionists like Garrison get together and they form the American Anti-Slavery Society, AASS, the American Anti-Slavery Society. We'll look at some of these societies later. These were locally based, district, town-based organizations, membership organizations. They held regular meetings in which uh, people discuss slavery and how to fight it. Tomorrow, in some of our workshops, we're going to look at some documents from these anti-slavery societies. Um, regular officers, dues, programs, <coughs> lectures, talks, etc., etc., etc. They also um, were committed to the printed word and the image. Abolitionists were literate people, partly because they came out of the church, but partly because literacy is high here. The, the, the printed word is really, really important to abolitionists, and so is the image. So what abolitionists did is they produced propaganda, very, very effective propaganda. Here you have uh, uh, two images which sort of sum up uh, the moral opposition to slavery. In the first, you see a planter whipping a mother while he ripped the baby from her arms. This is the most powerful critique of slavery. Uh, if you've read Uncle Tom's Cabin, you know uh, that this, this was precisely what Harry Beecher Stowe was getting at. Slavery destroys the family. It's an unchristian institution. Only evil people tear up families. Again, the lash. The interesting thing is here, this is sort of a metaphor for the powerlessness of slaves in the face of planter power. This image would be discussed in written form in slave narrative after slave narrative in which slaves, ex-slaves, describe the situation in which a planter took their son in front of the whole family and beat him to smithereens with a whip, daring the father and mother to intervene, daring them to intervene. There's no more powerful image than this. It, 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 nothing, nothing more emphasized the powerlessness of family members or of parents in the face of the of power of the planters. So most Northerners understood slavery through these kinds of images. The mercies of the wicked are cruel. The tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. This is the famous Wedgwood image. This is developed in England, would become the image of the, England, the, the World Anti-Slavery Society in Britain. Americans picked this up. They, they made the equivalent of t-shirts, put the image on t-shirts. Shrewder Americans made pottery out of this. So you would be invited to someone's house for dinner, and you'd be slurping some stew, and having a good time, or soup, and you got to the bottom of the bowl, and look what's staring you in the face. It was to remind you that some people can't eat properly. Really, really ingenious and effective um, propaganda. I'm a man, aren't I a brother? Um, one reason why these people are so effective as propagandists is that they are many of them, the leadership, many of them were merchants who understood what trade was all about and getting messages out. Many of them were journalists. Garrison was a journalist. But the other thing is to take advantage of technology. In the 1830s, the steam press is invented. So you could print things 50 to 100 to 200 times faster in the 1830s than you could by, by a hand crank press. The steam presses, once you put the paper in, just, the stuff just flew out. The American Anti-Slavery Society, by the middle of the 1830s, is printing over a million pieces of propaganda a year advantage of the mail, just mailing this stuff all across the country. 
So the anti-slavery movement begins looking a lot stronger than it actually was. No, Southerners began talking this about this. This is an insidious conspiracy. We have to get these people. So needless to say, they put a price on Garrison's head, and they suppressed the mailing of um, abolitionist propaganda through the US mails. Another thing that um, anti-slavery did was they promoted, they promoted gifted African Americans. This is Frederick Douglass. Everybody knows Frederick Douglass, right? Escapes his, his Maryland master in 1838. Where does he come? Massachusetts. Massachusetts, uh, New Bedford, and stays in New Bedford for a while until he figures out that they won't let him work on the docks, and he will leave uh, after a while for New York. But he spends a good deal of time here, late 1830s and early 1840s. Becomes a friend of Garrison. Becomes one of the most important um, abolitionists activists in the country, a spellbinding speaker, um, pretty difficult guy to get along with, but so is Garrison. Um, this is his narrative. This is one of scores of slave narratives that were produced, interestingly enough, by abolitionist sponsors. So abolitionists not only put out propaganda, images, etc., they also help African Americans write their narratives and make sure they get published and then distributed. Uh, Frederick Douglass was so good at writing autobiographies, he wrote three. This is 1845, he does one in 1855, and then one, I believe, in the 1890s. Uh, since he's a good abolitionist, Douglass had his own newspaper, Frederick Douglass's newspaper. Uh, this, too, is available. You can get it, um, you can get it in most libraries. Uh, the, the emergence of this newspaper uh, at late, in the late 1840s and early 1850s opened up a, uh, a breach between Garrison and, and Frederick Douglass. They became mortal enemies. Now, um, there were also um, all kinds of activists involved in anti-slavery groups in Massachusetts and elsewhere. This is Charles Lennox Remond. Um, this is his dress, uh, looking pretty fancy. Um, they became stars. People would pay to see these. Uh, they were really good orators. Redmond was the son of a prominent um, African-American family in Salem that had migrated from Suriname. Um, his sister, Sarah Parker uh, Redmond, would, um, get would be involved in an ugly incident in the early 1850s. She, 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 attend she, sent she wanted to attend the opera in Boston, so she sent a friend. She ordered some tickets, as it were went to pick the tickets up at the theater, and with their friend, they went and sat in the white section of the theater. The owners, the manager showed up and ripped her out of the seat, threw her down the stairs. Uh, she got severely hurt. Uh, she sued, and uh, she won the case. So her sister is responsible for one of the first lawsuits against discrimination um, in, in the Commonwealth. Sarah, for her part, would go to Italy and um, become um, a nurse sort of doctor, and she's buried in the Protestant Cemetery in Rome um, amid, amid other Yankee expatriates. This is Lydia Mariah Child, also an activist who writes one of the first tracts, anti-slavery tracts uh, in the 1830s. She's a loyal Garrisonian. I believe the family was originally from Medford, sort of a middling, middle-class family. This is Lucretia Mott a stern-looking Quaker uh, from Philadelphia. Uh, Mott would become a leading anti-slavery speaker, and as we'll see uh, later on today, a, a leading feminist as well. Nothing surprising about a Quaker becoming an abolitionist. There's something surprising about her. Uh, this unlikely-looking abolitionist is Angelina Grimke. Um, no one ever said she was a knockout. Uh, <laughs> Her sister, uh, she looked like she's weaned on a sour pickle. Uh, her sister was equally dour and sour looking. Interestingly enough, they're daughters of a South Carolina planter. Her older sister, Sarah, uh, accompanied her father to Philadelphia in 1819 on a convalescent trip and got really interested in Quakerism. Uh, in 1821, she would leave her family and settle in Philadelphia to become a Quaker. 
In 1829, Angelina joined her and so the Brinkley sisters in Philadelphia. By 1835, they begin writing letters to Garrison, to the Liberator, arguing uh, that women have a role in, this, in, in the anti-slavery movement. Uh, Garrison thought that was a good idea. Garrison endorses the idea. In fact, in 1837, uh, the sisters come to Massachusetts, and Garrison engages them to go on a speaking tour. They do, uh, and it causes, well, to put it mildly, all hell breaks loose. Uh, the Protestant clergy uh, thinks that this is really inappropriate, and they circulate what's called the pastoral letter, in which uh, they condemn women for, quote, stepping out of their sphere. Women are supposed to be in the home. And also, for uh, speaking to what they call promiscuous audiences. A promiscuous audi audience is something like this, men and women. Um, the sisters condemn this kind of thing. And in 1837, they team up and they write one of the first feminist tracts um, against, uh, um, um, in behalf of, of women's rights. Um, Sarah wrote after the circular letter, the pastoral letter, was circulated by the Massachusetts clergy. They wrote, we are placed very unexpectedly in a very trying situation in the forefront of an entirely new contest, a contest for the rights of women as moral, intelligent, and responsible beings. The next year, uh, they would write letters on the equality of the sexes and the condition of women. So for the Grimke sisters, Getting involved in anti-slavery work was a way into women's politics. And there was an important group of, of, of anti-slavery women's activists who had become the pioneers of the feminist movement um, as the 1840s wore on. Okay, so we have men, women, uh, black and white, um, involved in, in anti-slavery. The question is why? I mean, why do these people get involved? And there are really a whole bunch of, no single answer to this. For some, it was uh, the new Protestantism. Uh, the new Protestantism, what we call evangelicalism, emerges um, in the 18 teens and 20s. Uh, it's part of the so-called Second Great Awakening, in which women, excuse me, in which um, Protestant clergy are arguing that um, you can save yourself. That you don't, it's not a matter of being elected by God be saved, what you can do is you, you can become your own agent. You can become your own agent, and you show your own religious agency, partly through piety, by which they meant prayer and devotion, but even more so through moral uh, purity. So it wasn't enough to have right beliefs, you also had to have right behavior. And so this idea of right behavior led all kinds of abolitionists, excuse me, led all kinds of Christians into anti-slavery. The argument is quite simple. Slavery is a sin. And it's the job of Christians to eliminate sin. So a good faction of the anti-slavery movement comes right out of the Protestant evangelical church. Another faction um, that overlaps with the first were people who simply believe in the Declaration of Independence. All men are created. In other words, what we call the cult of equality. But slavery to them was a gross violation of the idea of equality. Politics helped. Politics helped. Um, if you follow American politics, if you follow American politics recently, you should have the idea that America is run by the South, by Southerners. 19th century was even more so. The first two justices of the, of the Supreme Court, Southerners. Speaker of the House, through most of the 19th century, Southerners. Uh, the most important voices in the Senate, Southerners. Um, they had a stranglehold on the federal government. Everybody knew it, and it's beginning to annoy uh, Northerners. And so in the 1830s, Northerners are beginning to protest uh, political control by the South. So there's all that working, plus the, the, the conversion of the anti-slavery movement itself. Um, some people got converted to anti-slavery by going to listen to Garrison or Frederick Douglass. In some cases, it ran in families. If you've uh, had a chance to dip into uh, 
beyond garrison, you should know that mothers passed it on through their daughters, and daughters and sons are to their siblings. So there's a familial, there's a familial aspect to it, which is really important. All of Garrison's kids were named after abolitionists, and every single one became an abolitionist. There are other factors uh, you, you can cite, um, but I won't bore you with it. The point is, the movement is strong. Um, in, in the late 1830s, it's causing a ruckus uh, in national politics. But the movement is also <coughs> fraught with division. In the late 1830s, when Garrison begins arguing that women's rights is a good platform, it's a good idea, he's beginning to annoy certain people. Also, his, um, his opposition to politics is beginning to annoy certain people. No one more than this guy. This is Eliza Wright. Um, who was a friend of Garrison's and who by the 1830s said, you know, you're nothing more than a fanatic. He started calling Garrison the Pope. Um, a political illiterate who was also involved in women's rights and women's rights, rights distracted the movement from its primary goal. And its primary goal was to free the slaves. So this tension in the movement between anti-political abolitionists <coughs> and political abolitionists and feminist abolitionists and anti-feminist abolitionists results in a split in the movement in 1839. Elijah Wright would leave the group out of the moral suasion group. He and James Bernie would form of the Liberty Party. Liberty Party is formed in 1840, and it is the first party uh, in the Western world uh, devoted to the abolition of slavery. It argued that the Constitution you can't abolish slavery where it is in the Constitution. So what they want to do is separate the Constitution from slavery. They argued that you could abolish it within the states and within the territories. So uh, they also have a, a policy of containment. The idea was to contain slavery where it was. And if you could do that, it would die. You could chunk it off, preventing the internal slave traffic, abolishing slavery in the District of Columbia. And finally, they came out for civil equality for African Americans. Now, um, this is an important uh, point. Well, let me just let me just finish the Garrison piece. Garrison is still active uh, through the 1840s, but Garrison becomes increasingly critical of politics, politicians, voting, any kind of political engagement, and he organizes his group around the slogan "No Union with Slaveholders." Slaveholders. Garrison thought that the North could secede from the Union. And if the North seceded from the Union, it would provide a safe house for slaves from the South. So he becomes, in my view, increasingly irre irrelevant to the struggle. He writes politics and really marginalizes his faction of the movement. The, um, not so with the Libertyites. The Libertyites begin agitating more and more heavily for African American rights. Now, this is really important for this reason. In the 1830s and 40s, almost every, cons every state in the Union rewrote its constitution in constitutional conventions. Several of them, the best example being Pennsylvania, granted citizenship rights to all white males. So they eliminated property qualifications for citizenship. When they promoted white males to citizenship, they demoted African Americans by taking the vote of them. So the 1830s and 40s in the North is a period of disenfranchisement for African Americans. Liberty Party activists begin arguing against that. <coughs> they also begin arguing against black laws. Many northern states, most famously Cincinnati, passed laws that barred African Americans. If you were an African American, you could not enter uh, the state of Ohio unless you had a bond, unless you had a bond. That, uh, that protect, uh, in theory, it sort of protected you um, and, 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 and vouched for your, your passivity. So several states have black laws. Several states are beginning disenfranchising African Americans so that by the 1840s, the middle of the 1840s, African Americans are proper citizens only in New England. Massachusetts, Maine, Vermont, uh, New Hampshire, not Connecticut. Connecticut disenfranchised African Americans. New York instituted a property qualification. The struggle for citizenship reaches particular heights in Massachusetts in 1840, 41, and 42. 
1842, the Libertyites established the balance of power in the legislature, and they put through a series of reforms that would make Massachusetts the bellwether of the North when it came to citizenship rights. First, in 1842, the legislature repealed the law, two laws from the 18th century, that made it illegal for whites and blacks to intermarry. The argument was this is a residue of the old slave code, it's anti-Christian, it's, it's, it, it puts Massachusetts in league with the South, it has no place in a northern state that's repealed. We also passed a personal liberty law, a personal liberty law that made it illegal for the state to cooperate with the federal government in returning fugitive slaves to their masters. So if, if a federal official tracked down a fugitive slave in Massachusetts, you couldn't house them in a state jail. You had to find someone at somewhere else to, to, to retain them. Third, we came within a single vote of desegregating the railways. First state to do that, too. Um, rather than uh, uh, submit to state power, what the railways did is they voluntarily desegregated their lines in 1840 and 1844. In 1845 and 1846, the city of Boston desegregated its schools. In 1855, the state of Massachusetts desegregated its schools. So Massachusetts, because of the work of Libertyites and their successors, uh, especially Free Soilers, I don't have time to point to them, and other anti-slavery groups, this, this state becomes the most advanced on the question of African-American citizenship. But um, uh, African-Americans, especially fugitive slaves, are never safe. In 1850, as part of the um, Compromise of 1850, the federal government passed probably the most radical law it ever passed in the 19th century before the 14th Amendment. Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 empowered the federal government to track down some fugitive slaves. It allowed judges to set up special commissions to hold special trials. It was, uh, people who tracked down fugitive slaves were given a bounty. Judges who convicted them were given a bounty. Uh, blacks had no rights speak, no rights to, to, to legal counsel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, this is a, a, a landmark law because we had a very weak national government here. This was the most important exercise of national power I can think of before the, before the Civil War. Needless to say, um, Northerners, especially Bostonians, were pretty upset by this. Um, in 1851, they, they fight several efforts of federal agents to capture fugitive slaves and take them back home. There's a famous case. Shadrach Minkins was taken before a judge in 1851, and while he was standing before the judge, a bunch of abolitionists snuck into the courtroom through that door, whisked him away, and sent him out that door, put him on a stagecoach, and sent him to Canada. Um, direct action, as it were, um, in, in, in behalf of, um, of fugitive slaves. In 1854, the most famous fugitive slave case at all Appears. This is Anthony Burns. Burns had been a slave in Virginia, stowed away on a ship in February 1854, got to Boston, and he was busted by a policeman on specious grounds because his owner's agent had fingered him. He said, that's Anthony Burns. That's our slave. Burns is incarcerated. Flyers go out in 1854 in May because he's about to be taken back uh, to Virginia. This is um, a picture, of, this is a, a representation of the city of Boston. 50,000 people poured into Boston in May 1854 to protest this rendition of the Burns. Um, merchants draped their buildings in black crepe. Someone took a wire and strung it across Commercial Street from the third floor and in the middle of the wire was a coffin with a black coffin with the word liberty chopped up to it. This was theater. This was high theater. This is a view from a merchant's window in 1854. Uh, the rumor is, the story is that one of these merchants uh, watched powerlessly as 
military men marched, marched Burns down to Commercial Street to the dock and sent him on his way. The merchant went into his office, buried his face in his hands, and he cried. Son asked him what was wrong, and he said, well, I just figured there is such a thing as the slave power. So uh, there, is, there are violations of African-American citizenship um, and ordinary human rights. <coughs> In 1857, I'll just rush to the conclusion here, there's a famous case, the Dred Scott case here that most of you know about, in which the Supreme Court decided African Americans are not citizens. Not simply slaves, African Americans are not citizens. So this, this, um, this steal the fight for African American citizenship. In fact, Sarah Parker Remond, who I mentioned before, wanted a passport to go to Italy. She couldn't get a passport from the federal government because she wasn't a citizen. Who gave her a passport? Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Nonetheless, the Dred Scott case sticks in everyone's craw. Um, as the Civil War unfolds, um, we end the Civil War, as you know, in 1865. And this sets the stage for the last and most important struggle for African American citizenship. The South is defeated in 1865. They have elections in November 1865. The South makes it clear it resists Northern efforts to intervene in its affairs. So much so that they do several things. First, they pass these laws called Black Codes. Black Codes um, reduced free people to virtual slaves. You had to have a job by January 1st each year be incarcerated, and if you were incarcerated, you would be bound out to an employer. You couldn't engage in any occupation other uh, than, than farm work. You could make contracts. So if in, order to, in, order, in order for you to work, but you could not sue or be sued. That's one backdrop to 1865. When elections are held in 1865, um, Southerners return Confederate officers to Congress. Northerners have decided that makes a mockery of the Civil War. We cannot tolerate this kind of thing. And Reconstruction begins. Reconstruction was an effort on the part of the North, abolitionists and Republicans alike, to make the North, make the South over. One of the most important aspects of making the South over was to make African American citizens, partly for idealistic reasons and partly to ensure that Republicans would have political power in the South. And so they passed the 1866 Civil Rights Act. This act made African Americans citizens in no uncertain terms. It's a landmark law. It was the first time it was ever done by the federal government. But since Republicans feared that that law could be repealed, they decided to enshrine it in the Constitution, and therefore we get the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment uh, is ratified in 1868. The 14th Amendment stated that all persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens. It also bound the states. It required the states to recognize the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. Now, this is an important point, you know, because we have a federal system of government here. We have the federal government. And then we have state governments. If you read the Constitution carefully, right, especially the Bill of Rights, who cannot, who cannot establish religion? The federal government, right? The federal government. What about the states? Could the states, in theory, establish a religion? In theory, they could because they're not bound by the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment was designed to protect African Americans in the states. You got it? In the states in the states themselves. So the states had to follow the same laws as the federal government. Now just to ensure that there was no ambiguity about what citizenship meant, in 1870, we, we, we ratified the 15th Amendment, which gives blacks, African-American men, the right to vote. Should have been a happy story. Things should have ended there. The struggle began in the 1780s and 1790s. Citizenship was becoming much, much more important um, as time wore on. But there are a series of Supreme Court cases um, in the 1870s and 1880s that basically nullify 
the 14th and 15th Amendments. Probably the most important is what's called the slaughterhouse cases passed, uh, excuse me, decided in 1873. It's a complicated case, but the gist of it was that the 14th Amendment does not require the states to obey federal, excuse me, does not bind the states to recognize the, four, the first 10 amendments of the Constitution. The 14th Amendment guaranteed national citizenship only. National citizenship only. There are other cases that we've decided in the 1870s, and there would be a rollback, a rollback of African American rights. Finally, um, the question of citizenship agitated the gender question. It agitated the gender question. Remember, women had been involved, had been involved in the civil rights movement from the beginning. <coughs> from the beginning, in the 1830s and 1840s. When the 14th Amendment is proposed, women's activists decide, why not us? Us too. And they begin agitating for um, making the 14th Amendment apply to women as well as men. Um, this is you know these people. This is Elizabeth Cady Stanton. She was the wife of uh, William Brewster Stanton, an important abolitionist. And this is Susan B. Anthony, who never married. They are the most important feminist activists of their generation. Um, Stanton said of the 14th Amendment, if the word male is written into the 14th Amendment, it will take a century at least to get it out. It will take a century at least to get it out. She was right um, when, she went to, when they went to Frederick Douglass and said, look, we need help. We supported you, now why don't you support us? And Douglas coolly said, it's the Negro's hour. So they were frozen out of the 14th Amendment. They begin, uh, they form an Equal Rights Association arguing for the 15th Amendment. Um, to read them into the 15th Amendment, when Congress refuses to do it, they oppose the 15th Amendment and they, for, and they begin arguing for a 16th Amendment. Uh, it never passes, uh, they're left out in the cold, and um, the tragedy is, the tragedy is that a struggle uh, for citizenship rights that began um, in the 18-teens and 1820s and picked up steam uh, before the Civil War, by the 1880s, by the 1870s, really ends in failure. Uh, African Americans don't have the right to vote. Uh, they're really stripped of it. Things would get worse in the 1880s and 1890s. And the women's movement, which had supported them, is not only really left out in the cold, but it splits. Uh, some women argued for a new, a new uh, uh, amendment to the Constitution. Others, more conservative women, most of the New Englanders, argued for uh, a step-by-step -step approach in the states. One way or another, what had started, really, as a pretty heroic movement uh, for citizenship, ended in failure, and it would not be rewritten um, until the 1960s, when the Civil Rights Act the Voting Rights Act of 1965 restored African Americans the right to vote. When Lyndon Johnson signed that bill in 1965, he supposedly murmured to a friend, I think we wrote off the South for another generation. Lyndon Johnson was right. Southerners were so upset by the 1965 Civil Rights Act, they began to vote. By 1980, the South was solidly Republican. By the way, so was the rest of the nation. What happened yesterday, what happened yesterday shows that Lyndon Johnson was wrong. He gave the South only a generation. And what happened yesterday, to fill the promise, started in the 1820s. So we have a lot to celebrate. Thanks. Open up to Q&A. Sure. Any questions for Dr. Lord? Yeah. You mentioned Walker's appeal in 1830, 1829. Yeah. Certainly, most African slaves, uh, uh, southern slaves, would have been illiterate. Yep. However, is there any connection between that appeal and say Nat Turner's revolt? Uh, Southerners argue that there was, uh, but we don't know. Um, Historians have been arguing recently. Um, do you know Jack Bolster in New Hampshire? Do you know Jack Bolster's work? It's called Black Jacks. 
about black semen and marriage. Uh, historians are beginning to argue that there was, as, as much as there was a, a, an underground railway, there was also a communications network right, uh, among black mariners. Now, if you think about it, if you ask the question, where did most uh, future slaves come from? The answer is the upper south, Virginia and Maryland, increasing from the lower south. And almost all of them steal away on ships. There, uh, there's a good number of African American mariners who are aware of this stuff. Whether they passed it on to Nat Turner is a connection I don't think anyone has made. Turner was a religious mystic. A religious mystic. Uh, I think he picked it up on his own. But it's a very good question. Uh, there are historians who dispute what I just said, and we have never seen the evidence. Do you think uh, technological uh, innovation and agriculture were actually eliminated the use of Not the 19th century, no. It wouldn't happen. Eventually, yeah, it happened in, in the 1940s. The Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1933, which was struck down in 1935, then resurrected. Uh, established a system whereby we paid, the federal government paid um, staple growers, cotton, wheat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to take acreage out of planting to raise the price. To raise the price. Some planters began <coughs> evicting African Americans. Right? And so law started a mass eviction in the, in the 1930s. In the 1940s, the evidence is African, uh, uh, Southerners begin using uh, tractors more and more. So the coming of the tractor in the 1940s confirms your thesis. Whether planters would have used it is another matter. Remember, African Americans are free after the Civil War. They, they get reduced into quasi-slavery. But planters always saw slavery as a substitute for machinery. Whether some of them would have adopted machinery is anybody's guess. My guess is no. No. Um, if you think, I think of it this way. You can't understand American slavery without understanding the, 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 the depth of race and race feeling. Southerners couldn't imagine African Americans in any other position other than slavery. Brazilians didn't see it that way, right? Brazil, uh, Brazil is a leading slave state in the world. Uh, by Brazil abolishes the slave trade in 1851 and abolishes slavery in 1888. In 1860, Brazil, there were many ex-slaves as slaves. Why? Well, slave, slaves were cheap. And so they continued to import slaves. And when slaves got older, they liberated them and replaced them with new slaves. Right? Um, so, uh, and then, they, then there's lots of intermarriage in Brazil. So Brazil develops this, this sort of middle layer between whites and blacks of intermarried people. And there's obviously a race problem in Brazil, but it's not as deep as it was here. So Southerners, technology didn't mean much to them, but what, what they were really interested in doing was maintaining racial subordination. And racial subordination to them meant slavery. To others, it meant indentured servitude, it meant peon labor, it meant contract labor, not so. They couldn't imagine another solution to the, to the problem. Because the problem was not simply a labor problem, it was also a racial problem. Latin Americans, you know, race works very different than the way it works here. We're the only place to have the one drop of blood. The old one drop of blood. Um, you know, the one, the one, you're, you're black if you have one drop of blood. Well, that's laughable in that. Everybody's got a drop of black blood. Yeah. Why is that? Why is it so unique to the human experience? I can't answer that. I can't answer that. One, one, one theory, one theory is that it's demographic. It's demographic uh, to this extent. When, um, when settlers came to the U.S., we came as families, as white families, men and women, and we were a settler society. So we want land. Uh, there are almost no blacks. And so for generations, whites intermarried with whites. In Latin America, uh, the first uh, conquerors are men. 
they need women and they intermarry. And so they develop intermediate levels of coloration that we never had here or didn't have here. Or if we did have it, race became so deeply ingrained that planters wouldn't even recognize their own children. So I think it's initially got to do with intermarriage and demography. And later on, with increasingly deepened sense, uh, an increasingly deep sense of race. The, the story I like to tell students is, um, is, the, um, is the ham story in the Bible. You all know ham? Who was ham? Who's, whose son was he? Noah's son. Noah had three sons, Japheth, Seth, and Ham. And Ham saw his father naked, right? And God punished him because he should have averted his eyes. But he saw his father naked. And as a result, he, uh, he condemned Ham and his children to exile, right? Now, if you read that, and they become the Canaanites. Now, if you read that story in the Bible, there's nothing about race in that story. But the Southerners turned it into a race story. Ham becomes black. It's an invention. I mean, that's some index of the depth of, of sensitivity about race here. I don't know another place that does that. Now, there may be equivalents in Latin America, but I, it's, it's not clear to me that that's the case. Race here, it just, it, it's, it's just loaded in ways that it's not loaded. It, wasn't. it was loaded in ways that it wasn't loaded elsewhere. Freighted, and it's fraught, and it's deep, and it's very, very hard to overcome. Yes? Just to clarify what you're saying, uh, if the South had won their independence during the Civil War, you're saying race would have gone on for an awful long time afterwards? Um, yeah. In my view, yeah. It was profitable. Uh, here's, here's something to think of. There's a, a historian named... Um, Getting his name. Um, he's in Oklahoma. I'll remember his name tonight. He uh, he's done a study of wealth, north and south. The south is much wealthier than the north. Now wealth is more evenly distributed, than the but if you count everything, right, um, uh, per capita, especially per capita GNP and per capita income, the south is much wealthier than the north, and it's all got to do with cotton. If you subtract cotton from the American economy before the Civil War, there's not much of an economy. Cotton is our leading export. It's our most expensive export. It's our most profitable export. That's point one. Point two, there's spinoff from cotton, right? There's marine insurance, there's shipping, there's storage, and where's that money come from? It comes from New York, Philadelphia, and Boston. So the tentacles of slavery reach into the North, almost everyone is complicit with the system, right? Um, everybody had a stake in slavery. That's why, in places like Massachusetts, if you're looking for the centers of anti-slavery, we'll get into this tomorrow when we do our, our workshop, it's not in the city. The cities, especially New York, Boston, Philadelphia, are uh, so complicit with slavery, it's very, very hard to agitate anti-slavery in those places. Anti-slavery is in the countryside. That's where the anti-slavery society is, because it's far from that wealth, that accumulation of wealth. Um, to get back to your point, yeah, uh, given that, given the complicity, given the profit, profitability, everything else, there was never a counter voice in the South to slavery. Yeah. Uh, the Brazilians, um, Brazilians probably the best counter example, the Brazilians begin developing an elite, this sort of worldly elite who take the position Critics of slavery are right. This holds us down. It holds back economic development. It, it multiplies poverty. And so when the Brazilians finally decide to end slavery, most of them say, yeah, why not? Now, they also try to reproduce slavery, but not in quite the way the South did. Um, remember, uh, the Ku Klux Klan is born in the South. It's, it's, uh, think of the Ku Klux Klan as the terrorist wing of the Democratic Party. That's what it was. It's very, very effective, extremely effective. Racial violence, you know, lynchings, lynchings increase in the 1890s. Almost nowhere else does that this kind of stuff happen, with the exception of, of South Africa. So um, I can't, it's very hard for me to imagine 
Southerners beginning to think that there's an alternative to slavery much, in, I, 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 just unimaginable to me. The, um, there's no debate in the South over slavery. In 1856, 57, the guy named Hilton Helper writes a tract, which is um, essentially an attack on slavery because of white impoverishment. They basically suppress it. Um, the South is, is just doing freedom of speech, freedom of expression. <coughs> the mass are censored. Um, white abolitionists have great difficulty uh, in the South. Um, if you want to be an abolitionist, you have to leave the South. Uh, uh, you might remember James Birney, whose uh, uh, portrait I put up. He was an abolitionist in Alabama. He had leave. So he begins working for the, for the um, Liberty Party. But that's the solution. You want, to, you want to agitate slavery? Don't do it in the South. There are laws against freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and they've got the federal government on their side. In 1850, 1835, the Attorney General, excuse me, the Postmaster General, censors anti-slavery mail in the South. Never happened. Never happened. So I can't imagine, and that's a long answer to a very short conclusion. I just can't imagine it. If, if the South had developed an internal critique of slavery then, uh, and that had some viability, yeah. There's, there's something unique about that region. You know, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's always favored one party rule. From 1828 until 1880, 1980, it's democratic. From 1980 <coughs> to the present, it's Republican, except for Virginia. Maybe North Carolina. But the interesting thing is, <coughs> how does the South change? I think most political historians are telling you it's because of demography. Different people are moving in. It's not the Southerners necessarily that will be truly more enlightened. It's that the economy is changing. Um, new people are moving in, things, and things are, things are quite different now. But I, I, I just I don't see it. I know it's a hard view of the South, but I just don't see it. Can't imagine. I don't think they could either. Yeah. So um, recently, I received it from one of the pamphlets that Brown University puts out about the Brown family and slaves. Yeah. Is there anything like that that we know about, like John Hancock or someone else who brought slaves? In Massachusetts? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, sure. Um, lots of uh, Brahmin families were slave traders early on. Is there anything written about them? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a book about that. That uh, the, the, the uh, there's a new book about the um, about the. Uh, the, um, the, the Rhode Island slavers, uh, I think if you, um, what, sorry? The wolf, the wolf definitely. Yeah. yeah um, type that into Amazon and you'll find the book. Or you can type in the topic. Any other welcome Massachusetts slavery? Massachusetts slavery? Um, slave traders or slavery? <laughs> you, uh, yeah, if you, uh, I think if you look at, um, uh, Pope's book, Disowning Slavery, I believe she has some, some sections in there on Yankee traders in Massachusetts. It's called Disowning Slavery by Joan Mellish, M E L I S H, Pope, P O P. -E. It's quite a good book. I disagree with you, but it's quite a good book. Yeah. Like Papa Borden and Paul River and the Jerseys and the Mills are so economically dependent on the cotton from the South. And it's like it's like this crazy alliance. It's like ever since that she has the northerners and the wicks, right? We're really depending on the South for the cotton. They kind of like Oh gee, yeah, you're getting, you're making huge profits because I think it's got real slaves, and we've just got like the big elite slaves up here working, and they're getting, you know, like really happy about the ten hour day and you know all this kind of stuff. And it's almost as if they were like anti slavery, yeah. only because they were jealous that yeah. you know they were making a bigger profit, yeah. and, and you're calling down the door. Yeah. There's a faction of that family, of the Gordon family, they're evangelicals. Evangelical Christians, and they're basically the other slaves. Nathaniel. Then they were more clean. More deep. Well, the argument has been made, and uh, slightly sympathetic, although I, I think it's more complicated, but the argument has been made 
that anti-slavery politics on the part of people like the Gordons blinds them to the slavery that you talk about. In other words, they were yes. I mean, they were I thought it was a place where you mentioned that a lot of people were sitting in their face and saying, well, if they're just as much as a slave holder. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, well, that's a southern argument. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a southern argument. Don't tell us about slavery. You have it where you are. By the way, your slavery is worse than ours. Because we don't fire people when the economy turns down. When they get sick, we take care of them. So George Fitzhugh argues slavery is the best form of socialism. It's a fake argument. Uh, but the Gordons are from uh, what I call country Whigs, a country, a country faction of the Whig Party. The Whig Party divides between cotton Whigs, who are the urbanites, this coal, excuse me, all cattle. I was going to ask you that. 